Hi, I'm Dr. Molly Marty, and welcome to Resiliency Matters. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Amanda Nickerson, a professor of school psychology and director of the Alberti Center for Bullying Abuse Prevention at the University at Buffalo. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. And I was just saying, I'm feeling the feels because the last time we were together in person, you and your mother and your son, so a three generation uh, experience uh, on the World Maker Community Resilience Tour in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, and I go back to those game drives. I think we shared 10 game drives. So a lot of laughs and just some awe inspiring moments. Yes, life changing for sure. Really amazing. But I digress. <laughs> so today we are talking about bullying. Uh, let's start with the definition. How do you define bullying? Sure. We talk about bullying as having three components. Uh, one is that it's unwanted aggressive behavior. Um, another is that it is repeated or highly likely to be repeated. So it's not just a one-time insult, but really a pattern of behavior. And the third component is that it involves a power imbalance between the person or people doing the bullying and the person who's being bullied. And that power imbalance can come from physical strength or size, being in the member of a, of a majority group, um, having higher social status, or, or anything else that could contribute to power. So I think that's so important. I want to repeat those factors. I think it's important to understand that definition. So unwanted aggressive behavior um, repeated over time and a, a power imbalance of some sort. And the reason I wanna really emphasize that is I, uh, as you know, have spent a fair amount of time, um, especially in uh, middle school counseling offices, I'd say is where I see this, and uh, a fair amount of kids coming in throughout the day. I'm being bullied, I'm being bullied. And as I watch the counselors interact with that, um, sometimes they are, and they need adult uh, intervention and to help keep them safe. Often it's a matter of that student um, benefiting from social emotional skills building, you know, resilience skills building, communication, conflict resolution. Do you see this in your center? Absolutely. And certainly working with uh, with teachers and other educators, they're seeing it a lot. I know of a school counselor that has in her office the definition of conflict and the definition of bullying so that she can sort of point to those and say, let's talk about what it is that you're experiencing. I think bullying is a term for better or worse, that's gotten so much more attention, but with that, it's sometimes being misused um, because people either don't understand or they think that that's how they'll get attention to their issue. But I always try to tell people, if someone's coming to you saying that, you know, explore more about what's going on. And you don't even have to necessarily say, that's not bullying because sometimes that leads down a path of making people feel unheard, but more, you know, what is it that's happening? Let's work through how you may be able to cope with this, how I may be able to help you and how we may be able to problem solve. But you're right. Sometimes conflict, which is, you know, two people having a disagreement, there isn't a power imbalance, there isn't an intent to harm. Um, sometimes that's mistaken for bullying, as is playful teasing and other sorts of behaviors that we might see in, in interpersonal interactions. As with anything uh, with humans, it's complex. So let's hold both, right? Let's hold that bullying is real and it does tremendous harm. And there's much we can do to intervene and prevent and help. And, um, you know, sometimes it is that the skills building, um, but really smart to say, put it on the wall so we can point to this and walk through it and um, don't directly confront, but say, let's, you know, maybe try this, do some skills building. So uh, good advice there for parents and for educators. So let's talk about uh, what you're seeing with bullying today. You know, kids are tapped on to tech 24 seven. I know there's been some changes and just how prevalent um, is bullying? Yeah, so prevalence rates are really all over the place depending on how it's measured, how it's asked, the time period that they're asking about. Our national data shows that 
uh, that adolescents between the ages of 12 and 18 are reporting about 20% of them are being are reporting being bullied in the last 12 months. Um, this surprises some people that this has actually been a decrease from about 28% that we saw about 10 years ago. Um, so in some ways, that's good news, but probably not surprisingly, at that same time, we've seen a huge escalation in cyberbullying. So it went from about 8%, uh, this was about 10, 12 years ago, to now more about 16% are reporting it. And it's still broken up a little bit with, you know, talking about bullying and cyberbullying. So I think that trend that we're seeing and that parents and educators are really struggling with now is the bullying in the cyber world. Yeah, it's... Uh... The anonymity, the difficulty tracking, the just not being able to get away from it 24-7. Uh, and I think kids are getting savvy. I was at a meeting this week with uh, educators, and they were saying within their school, they were hearing about more bullying in, in the bathrooms or in uh, locker rooms, in places where maybe the, the teachers or adult staff uh, couldn't have as big a presence. Uh, so, um, yeah, we just need to stay on top, top of this, especially in uh, this tech world. So let's talk about when, when we talk about bullying, we kind of think of the three players and, and they're labeled or have terms of bull, the bully, the bully victim and the bystander. So let's talk about that person bullying. Um, what do you, what can you teach us about? Like, is there a profile? Are there types of characteristics? Um, are there some interventions that seem uh, more effective? Talk about that person that is bullying others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I don't really like the word profile, but there's certainly characteristics that are more likely in someone who's a bullying perpetrator than someone who's not. Um, some of those things include a lack of empathy, um, that need for power and control is often a big one, um, endorsing aggressive attitudes and behaviors. So seeing aggression as a good way to get what one wants or deal with issues. Um, but those are some of the things that are uh, surrounding the individual. I think it's really important to also look at contexts and relationships. So individuals who bully are also more likely to spend time with others that engage in aggressive behavior. Um, the the climate and culture in the school matters. So if schools are sort of allowing this to go on or not sending strong messages about how we treat each other um, and certainly larger cultural and contextual influences, you know, sometimes it's norms of competition and uh, and real competitiveness. Other times it's more, uh, you know, violence and aggression that's happening. So I think we really have to look at not only the person, but the context. So clearly our interventions are usually multi-level, right? So it's not just working with that individual, although that's important to try to figure out what function is that behavior serving? Is this that someone has a need for power and control and they don't have more pro-social ways to get it. So we need to sort of build those skills. Is it that they know how to behave, but this is learned that this is successful for them. And then we maybe need to change the environment and the contingencies around it to make it so that behavior is not effective and doesn't get them what they want and it's replaced with something else. Um, oftentimes working with the family uh, it can be helpful. You know, is there more supervision and monitoring needed, um, more sort of behavioral kinds of interventions to send the message that this behavior isn't important. I, I'm sorry, isn't, um, isn't going to, again, get them what they want, that there are, there are better and other ways uh, to, uh, to get what they need. That's really helpful to break that out. I think that can be really informative if we just want to put like a bully in, a, in one bucket and, and we're seeing that, you know, that it's so important to look at context and culture and, and uh, these behaviors arise for various uh, motivations and reasons. 
So in, in putting out to our, our social media and our community that we were having this conversation, the number one question that came back that people wanted to answer uh, and get your take on is what can we do to help support the kids that are being bullied? Um, so let's, let's turn and, and focus on that. Um, what do we understand about people, um, especially kids in this context that are more likely to be bullied and um, what can be helpful? Sure. So most students that are bullied are tend to lack assertiveness and don't do anything to invite this bullying. You know, they are kind of by definition in a position of relative weakness um, because they don't have that power, whether it's that social status, that size. So there's something about them that someone who's perpetrating may see as a vulnerability that they're exploiting. Um, these students also tend, not all of them, but some tend to not have um, as many friends or, you know, uh, be as networked uh, in, in those social relationships. There's a smaller subset too that we, you know, used to call provocative victims or bully victims who actually seem to engage in more sort of irritating behavior. And instead of being passive, if they're bullied, they would also go on to be really reactive or bully others. Um, so so it differs a bit. Um, in terms of, of helping, uh, social support is huge. You know, having them connected with a peer group with a close friend that will kind of help buffer them from that. Obviously, we want to eliminate the bullying, but those feelings of isolation and rejection, if if we can really get at those, um, that that can really help empower. The research is a little bit mixed about teaching skills to those who are victimized. Um, certainly teaching them to be more assertive, to ask for help, to, uh, you know, try to, to uh, get away from the situation in different ways um, uh, seems like they'd be helpful, although, you know, we have kind of mixed responses to that. So I think really, you know, those social connections and having that, that peer group and peer support is key. And where the research is more clear on skills building are these bystanders. Uh, talk about bystander intervention. Sure. So bystanders are the people that see and hear the bullying that's happening, which is a huge group, you know, 80 to 85 percent of these interactions, other people see and hear, and they can take roles that will help the situation or make it worse. So we want to try to get people to help the situation. And so, you know, we can teach these bystander intervention skills about how to identify what's happening, um, see it as a problem, assume responsibility, know what to do and act. And one thing that we emphasize is that that action could be direct, sort of saying, stop, this isn't okay, but it could also be indirect, reporting it to someone else banding together with others um, and or providing support to that target. So I think that's a really important point. Uh, let's end on that, that there's some risk in intervention. And so you need to be aware of that. An intervention doesn't always mean confrontation to the bully, but it can mean support for the victim. Uh, a lot more to dig into. Uh, stay with us and we'll be right back. Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared. And you can be certain we'll keep your world connected. I don't remember how it started. Go to that. Oh Our back and forth. It always came back. Nice Dad! You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word.
if I could go back and change it all. I would. I would. I think I'm gonna miss you the most. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Or maybe it's just the little moments. I could go back and change I could go back and change it all. If I could go back. I would. But I can't. Resilience Matters. We are speaking with Dr. Amanda Nickerson, a school psychologist, and we are talking about bullying. Uh, Amanda, I want to say uh, I've had um, experiences, in, and I know there's anti-bullying legislation, I think in all 50 states now, um, but when it was being passed, I watched adult politicians stand up and say things like, today we are standing up against the bullies and, you know, taking this hard stance. And Part of me thought, but I don't feel that that's helpful because when you're talking about bullies in the childhood context, these are other kids who need help, who need support. Um, and, and there's various reasons why they bully as you've already uh, educated us about. Um, but how does that play? Am I, am I being too hard, too soft? What's your take on that? It, it really bugs me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really interesting the way that politicians, administrators, others, talk about bullying you know some are coming down with this really hard stance you know we will not tolerate bullying we are going to this is a uh, abuse we are going to punish it we are going to stomp it out you know campaigns about stomping out um bullying and things like that and although i understand where that's coming from we also know meeting aggression with aggression is probably going to cause more aggression. Um, also, our zero tolerance, so-called zero tolerance approaches really actually are pushing people more out of, of schools and, and social organizations where they would get some of the support that may actually help. Uh, so I think that that's a really, uh, you know, I think you can take a strong stance without doing it in a uh, overly punitive, aggressive sort of way that is is not going to recognize this as as a relationship problem, as a, as something that is is not helpful to the person doing it and to others. And how how are we going to work with the person, with their context, with the environment to to try to improve it? So I don't really appreciate that stance, nor do I appreciate people who say, well, we don't have bullying here. We're doing such a good job that you won't see bullying because I think, well, I'm not really sure where you've been, but it, it certainly does occur even in the, the best of environments. So I, I think that having a frank talk about this existing and we need to work together in a, in a holistic way to, to address this problem is a better approach. That's a really helpful mirror um, and, and gives me some language and, and a, a deeper perspective on it. So thank you for that. So we've been talking about uh, kids and then caring adults who, who want to be helping. Let's talk about these adults who were bullied as kids. I'm thinking I had a recent conversation. I just met the man that night and he talked about he was in a boarding school and there was relentless bullying, he said, and uh, he said it left a mark. And when he said that, it, you, you could see the mark. It was deep and, and decades later. Um, so what do you have to say to our, our viewers or listeners who are still feeling the impacts of being bullied as kids? Yeah. First, I'd just like to say, I'm so sorry that that happened. I wish that something like that had never happened to this person or anybody else. I am not a proponent of the idea that 
people have to go through these things and it'll make them stronger. We know that's not true. We know that there's short and long-term effects of bullying. We know that people may have internalizing problems, which means more depressed or anxious. Some people turn it inward and self-blame are more likely to have suicidal thoughts or attempts. And a small segment also may respond aggressively, reacting to the bullying. Having said that, it's not a life sentence or a self-fulfilling prophecy. So even though people that are bullied, they carry it with them, it's like another trauma that becomes, you know, part of our story, part of who we are, but there are ways to cope and ways to get support and work toward healing. So let me share another story along the lines of the healing. So I have a friend who was planning her 50th class reunion and she took on the task of calling classmates and making sure they'd be there. And her heart just sunk when she saw the name uh, on her call list because it was a woman who had uh, bullied her uh, in, in school. And she uh, just, you know, it was still so real to her and present to her. And she thought, I've, I've changed a lot. I hope I've changed a lot in these years. So she picked up the phone and called. And this person on the other end said, I am so grateful you called and I owe you an apology. I want you to know. And she shared some of what she was carrying uh, as, a, um, as an adolescent teenager. And she said, you were my punching bag. And I, I know that, and I am so sorry for that. And seeing my friend tell this story, she was visibly lighter. It's just that, you know, that burden that she had been carrying for decades was released. So it strikes me that, you know, that the bullying and this trauma happens in relationship and the potential for healing happens in relationship. Yeah, that's such a powerful story. And I'm so glad that she had that experience, you know, part of me thought, oh no, I hope she didn't call and, you know, experience that same thing later. Typically what happens with maturity and growth and, you know, and, and as you said, sometimes a lot of times the person bullying is going through their own battle that they may not be able to to deal with and this is the way that they're they're dealing with it so i think we do have to try to understand better where that is coming from um but you know at the time being the person who is the 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 recipient the punching bag that doesn't feel good i also i did a presentation with uh, adults and a woman came up to me afterwards and similar it was a reunion i think it was a 20th reunion and she said she had been bullied mercifully, mercilessly, excuse me, throughout her schooling and that someone came up to her and said, you know, I hated that that was happening to you, but I just didn't know what to do or say. And the woman said to her and to me, if she had just said that, it would have made such a difference. So that's one of the messages I try to send to bystanders is even if you don't know what to say or do, if you do absolutely nothing, it runs the risk that that person that it's happening to thinks that it's not only the perpetrator who is against them, but everyone else. And that feeling of isolation is perhaps worse than the bullying itself. So if we can reach out, if we can say, hey, is there anything I can do? I see you. I'm sorry that that's happening, that that could be really powerful. Very powerful. Um, just the power of empathy, all right, and, uh, and being with someone. So your work goes beyond bullying prevention as a school safety uh, expert and familiar with risk assessments. I think uh, one thing top of mind with parents these days are school shootings. And um, what is the connection between bullying and this perpetration of, of mass violence? Yeah, well, again, as with uh, bullies, as I said, there isn't really a profile of a perpetrator. The same with uh, school, school shooters. You know, there's many different risk factors that may go into that. But experience bullying is one of those. So in the U.S. Secret Service reports, looking at school shooters, um, many of them, three-fourths of them have 
a history of either being bullied or perceiving themselves to have been bullied. So that gets a little complicated. Sometimes there's when you go back, there's sort of this perception of they they actually weren't mistreated. They just, you know, acted different and people didn't really pay as much attention to them. So I think there's a little bit of that. But um, so I think we certainly need to be concerned about people that are treated this way, that may have unresolved conflict, may have, you know, situations that they don't know how to deal with and don't have support. Um, not to say that we should start thinking everybody who's bullied is going to then be the, the next shooter, but as we look at risk factors and how people are navigating various stressful scenarios, um, we definitely need to be thinking about risk and probably more importantly, uh, prevention and early intervention. So I don't want to bring a word to the conversation that I've been thinking about um, listening to Brene Brown's uh, Atlas of the Heart and uh, summing up the research on humiliation. So that's defined in the research as unjustified mistreatment that violates one's dignity and diminishes one's sense of worth as a human being. And uh, they talked about these media profiles and there's this high level of um, humiliation uh, connected to violence. It said it can trigger social pain, decrease self-awareness and, and self-regulation, increase self-defeating behaviors. Some researchers propose that humiliation is the, the missing link. And it's an, certainly an underappreciated force in understanding violent conflict at schools. And they said even in international conflicts. Uh, so we're talking world peace here, <laughs> Amanda. Uh, what does your research show on, on humiliation or shame and this connection to violence? Um, well, as I told you at, at the break, I'm I'm fascinated by this and I'm definitely going to look more into it. So we've done some research that's looked at uh, longitudinal research between involvement in bullying and then gun violence attitudes. And we have found that aggressive response to shame is the pathway from which the bullying involvement leads to the this endorsement of of gun violence, um, but shame, of course, is a bit different than humiliation. But I think that idea that there has been a wrong or that someone has felt, you know, shame, and this is the way that they've responded. Um, I think what you're talking about with humiliation and a lot of what's happening now is looking beyond individual into the context. So is this, is someone being oppressed, mistreated? Um, is there bias, hatred, and things like that? And, and those are really the things when we're looking, you know, at peace that, that we have to try to eliminate. Thank you for sharing so many practical tips and, and really a vision for a world without bullying. Uh, and, and holding that vision for us. And thank you viewers for joining us on Media Comments 22, your local programming leader.